Welcome, CJ. Good evening, Dean, and good, every, good, uh, good evening to everyone else who's attending this evening. Uh, I'm CJ Atkins, the managing editor of People's World Newspaper, and uh, since we're in the mode of making announcements, I'll just uh, make an announcement for an upcoming town hall event that's uh, this Tuesday, February 2nd, 8 p.m. It is the launch of the 100 Days for a Better World campaign. Uh, now, as you're, you might be aware, this uh, economic crisis that's been sparked by the pandemic is affecting People's World and the party, uh, just like so many other organizations out there. So there's going to be a launch of a, a major fundraising campaign to avert a crisis uh, for our organization. So I encourage everyone to go to the CPUSA Facebook page and check out uh, the link for that event. That's this Tuesday at 8 o'clock. Uh, okay, so let's go into our course for the evening. You know, like a lot of classes that the Education Commission puts on, this one came about uh, in the course of the growth and development of the party's membership. Uh, the idea for this course on Marxist analysis was suggested by Dee following a discussion among some people on the party's Discord, uh, the Discord server forum. Uh, there were a few people there who were talking about uh, you know, they were having some difficulty with engaging with the party's program, figuring out how it comes up with its analysis of the, the political and economic situation in the country, how it pinpoints where we are in the stages of struggle, uh, uh, the, the comprehending how the party really develops its strategy and tactics. So in that conversation, I had suggested to someone uh, the book that was on the list of recommended readings for this evening, Danny Rubin's 2009 title, Can Capitalism Last? A Marxist Update. Now, uh, it's a book that maybe I thought could have used a better title because it sort of hides the breadth of material that's in it. Uh, essentially, it is the curriculum for an entire party school uh, on the basics of Marxist philosophy, political economy, historical materialism, strategy and tactics, uh, what's needed to win socialism. There are a few parts of it that might be a bit dated now, more than a decade since it was published, but I think the essentials are all there for anyone who is new to Marxism or wants to polish up their analytical skills and, and understand how the party develops its, its strategic policy and its outlook. So uh, there's a lot in that book which was recommended, but for this evening we're going to focus particularly on Marxist methodology and analysis. So we're going to look at a few different questions. We want to get to the bottom of how do you think like a Marxist? How do Marxists examine different struggles and events? You know, there are always big questions that shape any kind of investigation, whether you're a Marxist or not. Uh, how do we understand what's happening? How do we comprehend people's and groups' different motivations? But as Marxists, we follow up those sort of basic introductory questions. We ask the question of how do we intervene and act in particular struggles? You know, these are the kinds of questions that journalists at People's World and activists in the, in the party's political action commission, writers on the party website, and really members and leaders at all levels, up and down and across the country, these are the things they ask whenever they encounter a particular strike, struggle. Uh, uh, or election. So let's begin our look at Marxist analysis with a real world struggle that's going on right now, playing out in Alabama. At the Amazon Distribution Center in Bessemer, Alabama, there's an effort underway there to unionize the workers, the people who pack the boxes, load the trucks, and do all the work that it takes to run a modern logistics center in the digital economy. We're going to start our exercise this evening with a news story, looking at how this struggle is presented in the mainstream press. Now, this is an article from uh, Bloomberg Business, which is one of the major uh, outlets that's read by people on Wall Street in the business press, uh, sorry, in the business sector. Uh, but a lot of the, the news wires, which fill our everyday newspapers like USA Today and others, take their lead from, from some of the, the, the material that comes out of outlets like Bloomberg. So let's just quickly read through this together. And we're going to be looking for what are the key points that this article uh, is putting across. Okay, 
Amazon workers at an Alabama warehouse were given the go ahead by federal regulators to vote on whether to form what would be the first union at a US facility of the e-commerce giant. An organizing drive became public last month when representatives of the retail wholesale department store union filed paperwork for an election to represent 1500 workers at the warehouse. None of Amazon's hundreds of thousands of employees in warehouses across the US is represented by labor unions. Amazon objected to the vote, saying in documents filed with the NLRB that more than 5,700 employees would be covered by such a bargaining union. That meant the union had likely gathered fewer signatures than needed, the company's lawyers said. Under NLRB rules, 30% of workers must sign union cards or petitions before the regulator will step in to oversee an election. Uh, the NLRB says they're satisfied. Now, here we are. Amazon has created more than 5,000 jobs in Bessemer with an average pay of $15.30 an hour, health care, and other benefits. And 90% of surveyed employees said they would recommend jobs at the company to friends. Heather Knox, a company spokesperson, said in a statement. We don't believe this group represents the majority of our employees' views, she said. Our employees choose to work at Amazon because we offer some of the best jobs available everywhere we hire and we encourage anyone to compare our overall pay, benefits, and workplace environment to any other company with similar jobs. Some Amazon workers in Europe belong to unions, but the world's largest online retailer has managed to avoid organized labor in the US, even as it has grown to become the second largest employer behind Walmart. A small group of Amazon employees in a Delaware warehouse voted against joining uh, the machinist and aerospace workers in 2014. All right, so that, that's just a quick news story from a, a typical uh, business outlet, Bloomberg. So let's just pick out some of the key points that we see in their story. First of all, it is representatives of the retail, wholesale, and department store union filing paperwork. None of Amazon's hundreds of thousands of employees is represented by labor unions. The union doesn't have enough signatures to get an election, the company's lawyer said. Then we have this great statement from the company spokesperson uh, telling us how wonderful it is to work at Amazon, how great the pay is, the benefits are, are amazing, and 90% of employees love the place. Uh, then we hear that this union, the retail workers, uh, department store union, does not represent the majority of our employer, employees. And other Amazon employees have voted against joining the union. Okay, now what's missing from this story. You know, we get every possible viewpoint you could imagine from the company's perspective, but there's so much that's not there at all. First of all, we never even hear why there's a unionization drop happening in the first place. Who are the contending parties? When you read this, it almost sounds like it's Amazon versus this outside force called the Retail uh, and Warehouse Department Stores Union. Or maybe it could be the NLRB versus Amazon. But what about the actual workers inside the, the, the warehouse itself who are trying to get a union? We never hear anything from them, no statements from their organizations or, or, or their, uh, their leaders in, in the facility. We don't hear anything about how the situation of these Alabama uh, Amazon workers compared to workers at the company's other facilities. So this, as we said, is a typical uh, example of how views and stories might be presented in the mainstream corporate press. But as working class activists and as communists, how should we be interpreting a situation like this Amazon union drive? Oh, also, I, I forgot, yeah, we, we never even heard why Amazon is really opposed to the workers getting a union. It was sort of just taken as, as a given. But what tools does Marxism give us to analyze this situation, to understand the forces that are involved, and then provide us some guidance on, on how to act? Now, before we, we, we really dig into this, I wanna step back just for a moment uh, and, and think about something here. You know, communists, reds, and radicals are, are often credited with being ahead of their time. In the Socialist Party, back in the early part of the 20th century, they were fighting for the women's right to vote at least 20 years or more before that struggle was, was eventually won. If you look to the 1940s, you had the Daily Worker, which is the old name for People's World. That newspaper 
was out agitating for the integration of black pay players into Major League Baseball years before Jackie Robinson uh, eventually debuted in 1947. And in a more recent case, the Communist Party USA was organizing people to focus on defeating the, that ultra-right and fascist prone segment of the US capitalist class way back in the 1980s, when few others were, were really even talking about the Republican Party's sharp turn to the right yet. And of course, it was long before Donald Trump had even toyed with the idea of running for president. So what I'm getting at here is that from women's equality to anti-racism to fighting fascism, left-wingers are more often than not proven right by history. But why is that the case? Is it because communists are more moral or more ethical than non-communists? Uh, well, you know, well, some people, some people might think so, but what we're getting at is that it's not because of good moral instincts that Marxists sometimes have the foresight to predict the direction of struggle or to know which struggles are worth putting, putting serious effort and organizing into. The reason that they are out front uh, is because of the Marxist method of analysis, which goes by the, the rather intimidating name of dialectical materialism. Now, that's a phrase that you'll come across in Marxism uh, over and over again in your studies. And as I said, it can be a bit intimidating or scary, brings to mind uh, abstract theory or high philosophy. And it is true that like any scientific method, it does have a lot of its own terminology and laws and categories and such. But at its core, uh, it really consists of a few pretty simple principles, tools that can help us understand and interpret social and political developments from neighborhood and community struggles to workplace organizing and strikes to national elections and all the way up to the fight uh, to replace capitalism with socialism. So what I want to encourage everyone to, to, to keep in mind is that activists and party members should never think that dialectical materialism or Marxist methodology is something that's reserved just for intellectual debate or for academics. It's important in the day-to-day -day organizing work that all of us get involved in. Now, there are endless lists of books and debates around dialectics and dialectical materialism, but really it's, it's a simple method. Uh, it understands the world by assuming that everything is always in motion and that everything and everyone, uh, every individual, every class, is always in motion and, and in a relationship with each other. Change is constant. But what is it that drives that change? And toward what end is it being, is it being pushed? So as scary as the term may sound, uh, that's really what essentially what it boils down to, finding answers to the questions of who's driving change and for what purpose. And it's actually right, right there in the name uh, of the methodology. So let's look briefly at the two halves of the phrase, and we'll start with the second part, materialism. Now, this is the philosophical part, really. Marxism takes the existing world around us as its starting point in any analysis, not the spirits or beliefs of some made-up theories, ideals, uh, or prejudices. So our analysis and everything that we're going to look at begins with the observable world. It searches for the sources of change in the material, in the physical elements of our world, okay? And specifically, it tries to understand how material forces interact with one another, how they're tied to one another, and how they're related. <sighs> Interrupted there by a cat. Sorry, I have a cat jumping on my desk, apologies. Okay, let's continue. The Dialectical. Now, this is the method part. The word dialectic uh, comes from the Greek dialogestai, which means simply discourse, dialogue, debate. And what is it that defines every debate that's out there? It's always difference, contradiction, and conflict. So we know right away that a key starting point in Marxist analysis is going to be determining what's the conflict at the heart of any situation. And to be more specific, 
looking for who are the different sides in a conflict or a struggle. And we're looking for their motivations in their material interests, right? And, you know, given that we're, we're all at an educational seminar that's hosted by the Communist Party, we know that generally we're talking about class interests here. But even just, uh, you know, figuring out who all the various actors are in a struggle can sometimes be a challenge, especially when one class often controls the narrative. They control the picture that we are presented. Just think back to that Amazon example when we looked at that Bloomberg article. What did we see in it? As we said, there were all kinds of diversions going on in there. Now, if we just take that example and, and imagine we scale it up, multiply it exponentially in the form of the corporate controlled media, film, television, popular culture, and of course, social media and tech algorithms take this to an entirely uh, different level. So that's what we're up against whenever we, we start trying to do our Marxist analysis. But with this methodology, we can, we can begin pulling that curtain back. So we're going to look at the way, as we said, look at the way the physical world is ordered and the way it's interpreted for us by those who control things like the media. That is going to do a lot to shape how we experience our world. Uh, and, you know, we are, as Marxists, as communists, we're not above being influenced by that picture that's presented to us in the corporate media, in popular culture. Uh, but we have to try to pick that apart and not use abstract ideas or rules of logic, but instead look at how things are organized and see who are the forces that are competing. Okay, now let's dig into these concepts with uh, a few examples that are hopefully easy to follow. If you look at any kind of textbook about dialectical materialism, it's always going to point out how Marx and Engels were influenced by philosophers like Hegel and and Feuerbach, but I think we can look at someone else who's influenced them, a name that a lot of us will be already familiar with, and that's Charles Darwin, who, who we probably have heard about in our high school biology uh, uh, and science classes. Now, Frederick Engels, who was Marx's partner and, and good friend, was particularly influenced by Darwin, and his theory of evolution is a very good gateway to start understanding uh, the Marxist method. Now here are some birds, some finches to be exact. These are drawings from Charles Darwin. Whenever he was doing his uh, explorations in the Galapagos Islands in the 19th century, he was trying to understand what physical forces could result in these different shapes of, of beak on the finch, which was essentially the same bird uh, at first glance, but it had very different kind of beaks on different islands in the Galapagos. Now, the way that Darwin tried to understand this was by looking at the physical history of the ecosystem, of the place uh, where these finches were, where these birds uh, were at, what other uh, natural forces they were interacting with. And he did this uh, instead of, you know, theorizing about how uh, these birds must have originally all been created differently at the, at the point of creation. He knew that there had to be some natural reason why they had developed differently. So he rejected this idea of independent creation, right, which was a lot like what we talked about, where we don't start with abstract uh, theory or philosophy, but instead we look at, at the physical and material world in front of us. So for Darwin, uh, each stage of, of these finches that he was looking at had to have evolved or developed from a previous stage. So he was looking at, you know, you have bird one, two, three, and four here with the different shapes. So he sees that to get from bird four to bird one, for instance, there must have been a slight quantitative change over time. What he observed was that the development between the, the, uh, uh, the, the development of these birds' beaks was really due to differences in what they were eating. Uh, he observed on one island where very hard seeds were what the birds had to rely on for their food. They had developed these very large, thick beaks, whereas on a different island, they were eating smaller, softer insects, and they had developed uh, a much thinner uh, and weaker beak. So for the way that Darwin explained this is that there was, in essence, a struggle between 
uh, seeds and beaks. So that as beaks get stronger, the seed shells also must have gotten tougher. That's the only way you get uh, the development of these two things. So for him, he was saying they were in a relationship with one another, a contradiction, a conflict. They impacted on one another and caused each other to change. So this very simple example of, of the birds developing because of different food sources is, is a case of the dialectic, the back and forth uh, of material change in physical nature. Now these changes, even though they're gradual and they, they take sometimes a very prolonged period of time before they uh, emerge, there are also moments when change speeds up very rapidly. Now in the science of evolution and, and biology, this is called punctuated equilibrium. Don't get too caught up on, on this uh, terminology. That's not the main point of our, our lesson. We just want to get a few concepts of, of how development happens here, because in a moment we're going to look at social development, okay? Uh, but just quickly here, let's look at this picture. We have the rate of change on one side and we have time on the other. So for a very long period of time, the change, the struggle between two forces is very balanced and it goes very slowly with only minor changes, subtractions and additions. But at some point, uh, change can happen very rapidly. So Darwin, for instance, theorized that at a certain point, a new disease might have been introduced to one of the islands and that killed off the favored nesting tree of, of a particular breed of finch. Many of them died, but those that had the slightly stronger wings, for instance, were able to get to higher trees, higher branches, and they survived. So in that moment, the old equilibrium, the old struggle had been broken. It was punctuated uh, to, use, to use the evolutionary uh, terminology. And then a new balance was achieved where evolution continued, but at a new level under new conditions. So if Darwinism is the science of natural change, well, in Marxism, we find the science of human social change. Uh, and that's the point that Engels himself made. He said that just as Darwin had discovered the law of evolution in organic nature, so Marx discovered it in human history. So when it comes to dialectical materialism and applying it to the changes of social systems over time, you get another defining element of Marxism, and that is historical materialism. Now, this picture, if we look at the basics of this chart, we can see that it's quite similar to the one that we observe from, from Darwin's evolutionary theory. And the same, the same processes are at work in, to a large extent. Change doesn't happen, uh, Marxism says, just because people have abstract hopes or dreams for, for some utopia, or because they heard good arguments that convinced them that socialism was the way to go. Those kind of subjective factors, they only appeal to people because of the situations that they face in their actual life, at work, uh, in politics, in family, uh, in all aspects of life. It's those material conditions that will open their mind or make them seek out how to change the situation they're in together with other people. So they experience conflict because of the material conditions. And they act and react as they try to change uh, the source of that conflict. Okay, now as I was saying, we saw in that Darwinian chart of evolution, uh, uh, similar processes that we see here in this chart of human social uh, evolution. If you look at feudal society in the center there of the chart, for instance, what we have is periods of long equilibrium where not a lot changes. Struggle is ongoing, but it's, it's simmering. But at certain periods of history, it can get broken by moments of rapid, intense, qualitative change. Now in social terms, if we're looking at politics and economics, these are the moments that we would refer to as revolution. When quantity becomes quality and a new society emerges, so this starts getting us into the study of strategy and tactics, which I think was chapter five in the Rubin book, um, where, we, where we apply Marxist analysis to actually planning out action. In society-wide terms, we start to question what stage of social development a given country might be in. 
are there stages of social development that a country still needs to pass through before the issue of socialism comes up? So once the strategic goal can be determined, uh, which, which can shift the balance of forces, it's necessary to use our scientific method, to use Marxist analysis, to look at the objective interests of, of different class and social forces, start asking about who can we be mobilized to fight for the goal that we're, we're trying to win, asking what the relationship is between these various forces, and looking to who can lead the struggle to win the goal and win progress. Now, as I said, this is the theory, the theory of strategy and tactics. Uh, it's something that I just went through in terms of, you know, big social system level changes, but it's something that we can also apply to the struggles in our cities, in our states, uh, at our workplaces, um, or anywhere really where we're dealing with a, a, a conflict of different relationship of forces, even on single issues. So. When we're working out strategy, we ask questions. We ask about what's the strategic goal, that if we win it, it can change that balance of forces and open the door to a more advanced goal, to a better situation for the working class. We have to look at who are the main opponents that the working class is gonna be up against, and what allies can be won by either side, whether it be uh, workers or bosses or what have you, who can they win to their side? What groups have a self-interest in fighting for that strategic goal? And who or what can be the leading force uh, to win it? Now, we've covered a lot of ground there in, in a pretty short time, uh, trying to keep it at an accessible level. But looking back at what we've just discussed so far, what we did without saying it was we actually went through the three laws of of dialectical materialism, which is really the basis of Marxist analysis. We talked about the unity and conflict of opposites. We discussed how change is driven by contradictions between groups, usually classes, that are rooted in their material conditions. And we talked about how these opposing classes are bound together in a social and economic relationship, old versus new, the dying versus that which is being born, disappearing versus developing, workers versus bosses, and then at the big picture level, socialism versus capitalism. Secondly, when we were looking at evolution and rapid change that becomes revolution, what we were just dealing with was uh, quantitative change resulting in qualitative change. This was the process where smaller adjustments or evolutionary reforms pile up, but they don't really always solve the core reasons for conflict. And eventually something can break, giving way to rapid development in a totally new situation. Third, negation of the negation. Now this is another one of those uh, uh, pieces of terminology in Marxist analysis that can, can kind of confuse people at, at some point or not be so clear. But really, all it means is that the resolution to one conflict will eventually become the source of a future conflict, and it itself will have to be replaced by something new. So the new will become the old uh, and be, be the source for another round of conflict. Just like when we were looking at that chart, feudalism negates slavery, capitalism negates feudalism, and so forth. That cycle of conflict and, res and, and, and resolution repeats. Now that's, that's all getting into the content for a more advanced class, and I understand that there is a, a section on dialectical materialism that's planned for later in the spring, so I don't want to go too far further into all this, this terminology, but I wanted us to pick up those basic laws because, uh, as I mentioned, they're going to form the analysis that we use as Marxists when we're looking at struggles and situation, situations. So let's just review a few of the questions that we need to keep in mind anytime we are approaching a struggle. So a Marxist will always start by looking at the material reality of a situation. We know that conflict and contradiction are the drivers of all change. 
And we know that there are material reasons for those contradictions and conflicts. So what are some of the questions that we, we should always turn to whenever we're getting ready to uh, examine a struggle? First of all, we're gonna start by asking ourselves, who are the opposing groups, the forces that are in battle with one another? Which classes are involved in a struggle? What are the material interests that's motivating these different forces to be in a struggle with one another? But again, because we are Marxists and we're not just trying to interpret the world, we also want to be a part of changing it, of pushing it forward, right? So we're going to move on and ask what action, if it's taken, can escalate or resolve the contradiction that we're looking at? What will resolve it in favor of workers and advance their conditions? What will it take to make that action happen? Do we have to organize? Do we have to bring in new allies? What kind of steps do we have to do to reach the goal that we're, we're trying to win? And finally, can we turn this struggle for a quantitative change into a qualitative one? For instance, can we take uh, a struggle in a workplace over winning a raise? Can we take that and make it into a struggle about bigger issues that are also uh, 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 part of workers' exploitation in that workplace. So let's now, let's take a look at what we've discussed and go back to our Amazon facility in Alabama. If we were journalists, say, writing for People's World, and we were going to look at this struggle for a union at that warehouse, using the tools for Marxist analysis, how would our article differ from this this Bloomberg one that we looked at earlier. Well, let's just see how People's World covered this exact same story. Uh, this is an article by Mark Grunberg, who is the labor editor and Washington bureau chief for People's World. This article is from the very end of November. Uh, there's been some developments in this struggle since then. Uh, but we can look at this and compare th those two stories to get an idea of, of how uh, the corporate capitalist press treated it and how People's World treated it. So let's look at just a few excerpts from this article. Okay, Bessemer, Alabama. Exploited Amazon warehouse workers in Bessemer, Alabama have gone beyond walkouts on Black Friday. They filed for union recognition with the NLRB. The 1,500 warehouse workers there are among a million plus Amazon workers in the US and hundreds of thousands more worldwide. In the US, the retail giant not only represses workers, but has refused to give them hazard duty pay for their continuing exposure to the coronavirus pandemic. The Amazon organizing drive is important for several reasons. The monster retailer owned by the world's wealthiest person, Jeff Bezos, is viciously anti-union and anti-worker, and a breakthrough at Bessemer would encourage other exploited Amazon warehouse workers to unionize. The organizing drive is occurring in the notoriously anti-worker, anti-union southern state of Alabama, although the steel workers have unionized tire plants there before. Unions have faced not just southern government and class hostility, but also constant divide and conquer tactics from bosses manipulating racial tensions and class conflicts. Amazon has constantly mistreated its workers even before the coronavirus pandemic hit. Examples include denying time off for Muslim holy days to warehouse workers in the Twin Cities, most of whom are Somali refugees. Workers who have spoken up have been fired. Amazon also refuses to officially disclose how many workers have tested positive for the coronavirus and how many have died. Make Amazon Pay, an international coalition of workers, unions, public interest groups, religious groups, and at least one scientific group, demands that Amazon end union busting, respect workers' right to organize and union rights, and stop all spying on workers and organizers. It also demands union access to Amazon work sites, a ban on retaliation and bargaining with unions wherever they are present to reach collective agreement on wages, benefits, and working conditions and Amazon should recognize workers' rights through its supply chain and implement ways for more democratic decision-making. During the COVID pandemic, Amazon became a trillion-dollar corporation, with CEO Jeff Bezos becoming the first person in history 
to amass $200 billion in personal wealth. Meanwhile, Amazon warehouse workers risked their lives as essential workers and faced threats and intim intimidation if they spoke out for their rights to a fair wage. The Make Amazon Pay statement also slammed Amazon, saying the company is not alone in these bad practices, but it sits at the heart of a failed system that drives inequality, climate breakdown, and democratic decay. The pandemic has exposed how Amazon places profits ahead of workers, society, and our planet. Okay, that is a very different article than we looked at earlier with Bloomberg. What makes it different? Well, this article asks some of those key questions and provides some answers that we talked about that are key for Marxist analysis. It asks, what is the contradiction here and who are the groups in struggle? When you looked at that Bloomberg story, uh, the workers inside the warehouse, as we said, were almost completely left out of the picture. Last time, all we heard was the company's claims about how it's a great place to work, how the employees are all happy, they'd recommend their friends all come to work there. But when you read this article, written using, using the tools of Marxist analysis, it becomes clear that this is a story of workers versus bosses, particularly Bezos, the top boss, who has seen his wealth explode in the middle of a pandemic when the rest of the country was, was losing their jobs and losing their homes. We are introduced to some of the material interests that are motivating and driving this conflict. We hear about why the workers inside the warehouse are interested in a union. As we said, if there weren't some problems, there likely wouldn't have been this union drive, right? So we hear things like no hazard pay, lack of COVID safety precautions, the company hiding information about how many workers have gotten sick, workers being fired for speaking up, uh, religious workers being denied time off for the holidays uh, and spying on workers. All of these things, those are the reasons that this conflict is really happening. But we didn't hear about that when you read the corporate press. And since we're partisan to the working class, as we said, we want to raise the question about what action is needed to advance the interests of the workers in this plant and their struggle against their employer. And we saw that when it's raised, uh, when the point was raised that a whole coalition has been built of, of different groups, environmental groups, workers groups, unions, and even scientific groups getting involved in that struggle. And finally, again, because we're Marxists, we give attention not just to this individual conflict at this warehouse, but we start looking at how it's related to similar struggles in other facilities, in other companies. From there, we can start to point uh, in the direction of the kind of action that's going to be needed to escalate this struggle from just one workplace into something that can yield a, a qualitative difference in the situation for all the workers in this sector, or even for the trade union movement as a whole on a bigger level. So that brings up what we, we call transforming quantity into quality. So those are some of the key steps of, of Marxist analysis. Uh, we ask those questions, we follow from the laws of dialectical materialism, looking for that unity and conflict of opposites, giving attention to how the quantitative can be turned into the qualitative. And at the end, uh, where, where Mark uh, pointed out that quote from, from the coalition about how Amazon sits at the heart of a failed system, driving inequality, climate breakdown, and democratic de de decay, that starts hinting at the negation of the negation, right? The need for a, a bigger change than just this, this one workplace getting a union. And the great thing about that article is that instead of People's World lecturing to readers about why this needed to be done, it let those workers and their coalition make that point themselves. They were the ones who, who, who spoke out and said that this was an example of a bigger problem, a whole, a whole failed system. So that, that is the task that is facing not just journalists at a publication like People's World, but of Communist Party activists in all the different community workplace and, and political struggles that they're involved in. Uh, this is the kind of analysis that we all have to learn to get better at using and, and use it to inform 
uh, our organizing and our activities. Because as Lenin said, all of development is really rooted in this struggle of opposites. So we have to get better at picking out who those opposites are and, and what's motivating them and how we can shape the struggle between them. Uh, and I really think that Marxist methodology and, and the analysis that we do is, is a big part of what helps inject what we call the communist plus into a fight. And for those who, who might be fond of the term, it's what helps make the communists into really a vanguard force in the various struggles of the working class. So this was uh, an introductory discussion about the bas basics of, of Marxist methodology. I know it covered a lot of ground uh, in a very short time. So I wanted to offer just a few suggestions to, to wrap up the presentation uh, for further reading and study that, that folks might wanna turn to if they're looking to sharpen their Marxist analytical skills. Uh, first of all was, was the book for tonight's course, Danny Rubin's Can Capitalism Last? If you haven't dug into it yet or, or thinking about returning to it, I suggest chapters one, three, five, and six in particular. Uh, there is also Lenin's book, Introduction to Marx, Engels, and Marxism. This is a, a really quick intro. It's easy to read. Uh, chapter six and eight deal very very uh, well with Marxist analysis and methodology. Uh, as I said, this is a quick intro. Um, Morris Cornforth, the book Materialism and Dialectical Method, which is there in the right corner of the screen. This one is out of print, but it's also another very readable set of, of lessons that were written as a, uh, a curriculum for a school on this topic. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner there, we have Dialectical and Historical Materialism, by Joseph Stalin, whatever other things darken his record, and, and I think there are plenty, uh, this pamphlet is still a decent, if somewhat rigid, introduction to this topics, but uh, it should be followed with, with more study from other sources. Uh, on the left corner, there is a pair of books from Soviet writer Viktor Afanasyev, Dialectical Materialism and Historical Materialism. Both of these are very good texts that have been long used in party schools. Uh, I often suggest reading Historical Materialism first and then the other one. It might be easier to, to get through them that way. And then finally, if you are ready to dig into some of the originals, uh, the original texts, then Reader in Marxist Philosophy uh, has selections picked from Marx, Engels, and Lenin that deal specifically with all of these questions that we address this evening. Uh, now, most of those books are available from international publishers, uh, which I've included the website there. Uh, that's the publishing company that's affiliated with the party, so it's good to support them whenever you can. Uh, and then the two on the, the right side of the screen are available freely online, if anyone wants to look into those. All right, so that, that's uh, a wrap on the presentation that I prepared tonight. Uh, so I think we can then go to, to discussion and comments and, and questions if there are any. Okay, thank you, CJ. We will now open the floor for questions and comments. If you'd like to make, uh, if you'd like to make a comment or introduce a question, just click the picture of the hand on your control panel and we will go through and uh, call. Uh, we will open your mic and you will be able to speak uh, um, briefly and then we'll close your mic uh, afterwards. Please, we will not be able to read uh, written comments and questions. Please click your raised hand icon to indicate you want to speak. Okay, Eric, unmuting your mic, you need to unmute on your end by simply using your mouse clicker to hover over the picture of the mic. Okay, Eric, you, you okay, Eric, no, the picture of the mic. Use your clicker to click the picture of the mic on your control panel. There you are, yeah. there you are. Uh, yeah, I actually, uh... <laughs> Uh, put my hand down. It was automatically uh, green, and I realized uh, when you started that uh, I, I turned it off. Uh, so I don't have a question, uh, but I won't take up much time. I will just uh, thank you, CJ, for a very illuminating presentation. And uh, 
Um, everyone should read Pupil of Oath. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric. You put your hand up again, so you might, might want to put your hand down. All right, Gustavo, I'm opening your mic now. Yes. Oh, hi. How's it going, guys? Yeah, this is Gustavo uh, from, uh, I live near Washington, D.C. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I have a just a very uh, specific question. Uh, you know, when you're in the workplace and uh, you're basically uh, intimidated by your bosses into basically capitulating at every one of their whims, how can uh, you get around that? As a worker, how can you get get around uh, this uh, uh, constant intimidation of basically just them firing you because you're not in the union? Okay, let's take some other questions and comments uh, before we turn it back to uh, CJ. If that's okay with you, CJ? Yeah, I think that's best. Okay. Okay, Eric, you keep putting your hand up. I keep lowering your hand. Stop clicking your hand, please. There you go again. All right, I'm just going to ignore that. All right, Jimmy, your mic is open. Jimmy, your mic is open. Speak up, please. All right, we'll move on. Just a minute. Joy, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end. Joy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, two quick things. Yes, I, I do think that when a company retaliates against an individual or a group for organizing, that's a very important type of question to ask. And I think one thing Amazon did, there was an Amazon employee in New York who spoke out and did organizing. And I believe secret messages were released from Amazon by someone who found out how Amazon tried to destroy this individual's reputation. Number two, um, CJ, <clears throat> When I'm doing strategy and tactic types of things, I find the approach you so expertly illuminated for us today to be somewhat intuitive. So your um, presentation <clears throat> helped me to bring it back into awareness, which I appreciate. I have one question. When it comes to the Beaks and Darwin, I understand how the beaks change in response to food. You said it's also the other way around, that food changes, or it's also the other way around. How does that happen? Okay, uh, let's take more. Looking for raised hands. Justin, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end. Hover your um, mouse uh, cursor over the picture of the mic on your control panel and click it to open your mic on your end. Justin Grimes. There you are. Oh, hi. I didn't hear it the first time. Um, so you talked about how Marxists can become the vanguard in assisting workers in um, establishing a new system. Um, do you think the blows that we as Marxists have suffered have um, contributed to us um, not becoming the vanguard that we would prefer? Okay, let's um, take one or two more. Lynn, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end or in your control panel. Hover your mouth, put your mouse cursor on the mic on your control panel and click. Lynn Yanelli. All right, moving on. 
Lori, your mic is open. Thank you, CJ, for that. It was such a lucid, useful presentation. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering if you could comment on um, situations where uh, the question of what material interests are motivating this um, struggle is really perplexing because it seems like the material interests of the party just contradict their own position. For example, that we find in some working class Trump supporters. And is there another set of questions, another resource, or how do we deal with that situation? All right, so you want to chime in now? Um, thank you, Lori. You want to chime in now, um, CJ? And then we can take more questions later and comments. Yeah, sure. Uh, a lot of these questions, you know, are the kind that all of us are going to face. They're not something that, uh, you know, me as a presenter is going to have an easy answer to, uh, especially when you start thinking about the one that Gustavo raised, uh, Gustavo in D.C., his question about when you're in the workplace and you're constantly being intimidated into capitulating and, and you don't have a union and there's always that threat that you're being fired. Um, I worked in, in restaurants and retail for years and years, so I know what it's like, you know, in that kind of workplace, never having uh, a union. And, you know, there's a lot of, I just want to say you're not the only one, and it's a situation where, you know, you can find solidarity whenever you relate to the uh, the experience of other workers and other workplace uh, workplaces following the same problem. But I would say, you know, you have to pick out your allies. and you have to know when you can and when you can't push the issue. You know, that's that's also a part of strategy and tactics. It's not always just saying, well, what can what can I do or what can we do to win? It's also knowing when the balance of forces may be up against, uh, maybe against you for now. And so uh, you as an individual worker won't always be able to get yourself out of that situation without finding a way to, to build a collective. Uh, among your, your other co-workers or among workers in other workplaces in the same company and the same sector. So there's not an easy answer of, of what do you do, um, but I think if you start taking some of these tools and start, uh, you know, you know what your material interests are, or at least you have a pretty good idea of them probably in, in the problems at your workplace. So start thinking about who else shares those same material interests. Yes, your coworkers, but as we said, workers in other places. Can you link up with uh, a coalition, an organization, a union that has has been able to fight back against some of these same problems in other uh, workplaces or other industries? Can you make a contact with them and get advice from the people who have been in that struggle? Uh, that's a part of what I would suggest. You know, if you're wanting to to start thinking about. How to, how to formulate your own strategy and tactics in that situation. Uh, but always start with looking at the balance of forces. What's, what's in your favor, what's not? Who can you, can you bring on side uh, as your allies? Uh, but I'm sure maybe some other, some other folks will chime in with comments uh, to, to, to have some advice on that too. Uh, Joy asked about uh, the part of the presentation was, which was talking about how the, the interaction, the relationship between the beaks of the finches and the seeds uh, and how they feed back onto each other. One changes one, but in turn, it's, it's back and forth, right? Um, how does that work? So in that specific example of that evolutionary change, what you had was if the plants, the trees that were producing these seeds were going to survive, they had to also evolve to having fewer and fewer seeds survive, right? So what Darwin observed was that over time, uh, the record showed that the seeds had started getting thicker to try to survive against the birds. Uh, but of course, the bird's beak also kept developing. So it was like this loop, this relationship, this conflict, right? Back and forth, each, each party to a conflict uh, has an impact on the other. And that's part of that unity and conflict of opposites. They're bound together, even though they're in struggle. Uh, one can't really exist without the other, uh, in, unless you have a real qualitative break in the situation. And in the case of, of human social evolution, evolution, we would say that 
once we get to socialism, we can finally get past some of those antagonisms and contradictions. Uh, but when it came to the, the natural evolution, that was the, the process at work there. Uh, let's see, Justin asked about the vanguard and whether the blows that we have suffered have contributed to us not becoming the vanguard that we would have preferred. Uh, you know, vanguard is always, I, I should maybe, I should have been hesitant to use the word because it brings up a lot of different ideas in people's minds uh, that vanguard means you're always the one out front waving the flag and everybody's going to follow behind you. Uh, and maybe at, you know, real tense moments of, of struggle, that's, that's how vanguard will play out. But in the course of everyday struggle, I think being the vanguard means bringing this analysis to a struggle. You know, it's, it's the thing that communists and Marxists can bring that most other uh, uh, allies in a coalition might not, not, might not have. That longer historical viewpoint that sees how conflicts have developed in the past and that gives clues about how they can develop and how they can change going forward. So I think that's, that's really the key part of what can make Marxists the vanguard. Um, of course, over time, you have to be proven right. You know? uh, just by having Marxist analysis doesn't mean you're going to get the, the correct answers every time. Uh, throughout history, communists have made bad strategic calculations or conditions changed and what they had, had said before was no longer valid. So becoming the vanguard means exercising that analysis, showing uh, leadership in that kind of way, in a methodological way, and over time, building up the, the confidence of, of your allies in a coalition or in a struggle. Uh, Laurie was uh, asking about the situation where people's, so let me just read it, comment on the situations of what material interests are motivating a struggle. Oh, often people's motivations don't seem to match their material interests. Uh, yeah, this gets into you know a lot of other aspects of, of Marxist theory too raises the concept of false consciousness. Do people really understand what their material interests are? Um, you know, some people have tried to look at this this situation of workers supporting Trump, for instance, as a case of people not understanding their own economic interests. And I'm sure there's some of that at work. Um, but what I've found is that more often People do know their material interests, but they reach the wrong conclusions about who their allies are or who's causing uh, the problems that they're facing. They attribute uh, you know, their lack of wage growth, their lack of jobs in their area. They attribute it to the wrong sources. So they, they don't really get past that first step of picking out who the real conflicting interests are, and they end up identifying with, with the, wrong, uh, the wrong side often. So, um, but there is a case, you know, there are many cases where other parts of the social, political, economic world can intervene and, and people latch on to those rather than the other material interests, which might actually be the primary ones uh, driving the conflicts that, that, that they're involved in. So um, I think we could even have a whole class on, on that and we should have more discussions on it because it's, it's really been a key struggle to deal with that over these last four years in the 2016 election and again in 2020. So it's something that we have to keep returning to, I think. Okay, we'll take a few more uh, questions and comments before we call it a night. Okay, looking for raised hands. Just a moment. May, your mic is open. Use your mouse cursor. Click, hover over, put your mouse cursor on the picture of the mic and click to open your mic. May Robinson. Yeah. Okay. I had my doubts about that article when I read about the average. $15.30 $15 wage, 
because as I know, averages are a really good way to hide the real numbers behind it. There were like a lot of people there and it could have been that there, most of the people were making under $15 an hour. And then there are a few of them who, or maybe even one of them who made so much money that he raised the average for everybody. That, and so it sounded very suspicious. I'm really wondering if Amazon gives the $15 wage or if it's still a minimum wage there out of Alabama or something. Thank you, uh, May. You should look into that. It, it does sound like uh, a bit shady to me as well. I agree. Okay, Perry, your mic is open. Hey, can comments hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Hey everybody, um, this is Perry in Philly, and um, thanks, thanks for this, TJ. This is really wonderful. Um, my question, and it's kind of in a sense what Lori asked a little bit too, um, when you raise that dialectics um, kind of parses the different sides and says who are the different sides. And my question is, what happens when there's more than one side? Like uh, one example I think of, you know, in the Philly club, we're reading uh, Hammer and Ho right now, but the CP in Alabama and, um, you know, in, de in defending the Scottsboro boys, like the party did, in a sense, it was, it had to take a side almost against, even at a surface level, like anti-rape and, and women's rights. Um, that's kind of a charged example, but the other one that comes to my head is like, when Israel points to its like LGBTQ rights record, like in a sense, does opposing the occupation of Palestine mean we're standing against um, its, you know, so-called uh, LGBTQ allyship or, um, I, I know there's not going to be a tidy answer for this, but I just wonder like what happens when there's different sides that are in contradiction with each other. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Let's get a few more. Rosalio, your mic is open. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, well, I think in, uh, the presentation about the basic forces of movement and contradictions has been very, very good. But when you get into the midst of struggle, there are many different contradictions. There are many different uh, uh, things are very much in flux. And also, people's minds, the ruling ideas of a class society are those of the ruling class. So we're going to get people to see the main contradictions can be hard and, and you have to do that in practice and you have people and seeing what's happening is that's how they learn. So when we get to Marxist philosophy, there are categories, uh, many different categories that we could can also look to to how to discern and move, what, where can you get to the, the right kind of combination of forces? So you look at content and form. What is the content that is in this situation or what forms uh, do we use? Uh, what, what can we, you know, as an organizing committee or as a, as a union itself or as a working group? And I, I think it's also good to get into uh, many of the categories later on. Uh, seeing where the basic movement comes from, of course, is good, is the best. But I think there are other parts of Marxist philosophy that we can bring to the struggle to help us move forward in the direction we need. Okay. okay. Um, Richard, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. There you are. Speak Can up, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Thanks, CJ. I um, I used to be a union organizer when I was younger, and uh, I'm glad you raised these issues. Um, you know, uh, sometimes people feel there's a cause, and it could be just. But as a union organizer, you know that you run in the times when you win, sometimes when you don't win. And you have to know when you have to pull back and sometimes when you can move forward. That's just the objective reality 
to what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I wanted to say that in this period of time, um, I didn't, didn't hear too much, but I think because of the times that we're in right now, I have not heard as much as I have now about this whole thing about science. And I think we have to emphasize that to a lot of people, that we as Marxists, we believe in science. And that's what Marxism is about. It's uh, based on science. Uh, a book that I always like is um, The Three Component Parts of Marxism, uh, which I would highly recommend. Uh, but one question um, I think should be added, maybe like they, they've been mentioning with others, is the idea of also differentiating um, analysis based on other analysis. You know, as we know, uh, there's a lot of groups that have analysis, but they base it on, on a different different uh, level. And I think that's important to note, the differences between uh, how we analyze and others. Um, uh, another one that often comes up is this thing about um, uh, determinism. Uh, there are those that believe um, this is eventually will happen. Um, but I believe, uh, Maybe you might want to make some comments about that, especially in the modern period that we live. I think it's um, sometimes uh, not necessarily that we will move into the, the next stage as we hope because of the dangers of the cataclysmic wars. So anyway, just thought I'd mention that. Thank you. Maybe one more, CJ? Sure. Thomas, your mic is open. Thomas, your mic is open on. There you are. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Just a quick thing. We've been trying to, you know, I came to the party not out of ideology, but out of struggling the um, Hawkins Humphrey full employment bill and then back in the 70s. And I answered with absolutely zero Marxist background. And right now we're working with some people that's in similar to my situation in our area. And I was thinking about, we, we got a hold of uh, Roberta Woods' um, uh, Marxist in the area of Amazon is one level, and then try to go to another level, uh, maybe the Communist Manifesto, the third one, Danny Rubin's book, and then the fourth one uh, would be the original works. I wonder if you had some kind of a, thing that you would recommend if you had to go levels of some person coming in and they're not having any of this background and seeing that terminology right away might uh, be a little too much. It's kind of overwhelming. But what would you recommend to go one, two, three, four for somebody just coming in on, on a struggle, not under any ideological background whatsoever? Thank you. All right, CJ, you have the mic. Yeah, okay, I want to start with the, the, what Thomas was just raising. Um, what, if, as far as what kind of text should, should people start with. Uh, so grab a pencil, there's a book that I recommend, it's called Economics for Everyone. Uh, and it's written by a guy named Jim Stanford, I think, S-T-A-N-F-O-R-D, might be Stanford, I, it's been so many years. But this is a book that's written by a Marxist, but it uses no kind of Marxist terminology. It, it's, it's immediately accessible. And it, it was written, uh, Stanford, the guy who wrote it is uh, an economist, or he used to be for the Auto Workers Union. And he wanted to write basically a book about Marxist economics, Marxist analysis, uh, without scaring people away by you know, putting Karl Marx's face on the cover. Uh, so I would recommend that book as, as a starting point, uh, and that for anyone you know who wants to engage in in these topics, it's it's a very excellent book. Um, so, yeah, it's called Economics for Everyone. That's the title, Economics for Everyone, and the author's name is Jim. I think it's Stanford, uh, but try Stanford or Stanford if if you are looking for it. But yeah, Economics for Everyone. Uh, it's basically a political economy slash Marxist textbook uh, without the terminology. It's written for you know a study circle of people who are new to this or who are advanced and just want to polish up. It's a great book. So I would start with that one. 
Um, and then you, you had a, a list of a few things that, that you all have been starting with, with Roberta Wood's pamphlet, the manifesto, Danny Rubin's book. Uh, th those are all great. And I think you mentioned the three component parts. Was that, or is that Richard who mentioned that? Maybe that was Richard. Three component parts of Marxism, which is in that, uh, that Lenin book that I have on the screen there, Introduction to Marx, Engels, and Marxism. One of those chapters is that three component parts. Um, even though you know some of Lenin's works were always very polemical and engaged in debating with this or that person, uh, uh, I think whenever he sat down to write that essay, he had it. He had in mind, you know, a, a newer party member or someone who was fresh to to studying this stuff, uh, because it's it's written in a really down to earth, accessible way. So that's uh, something I would recommend too. I, I'm glad that Richard brought it up again. Um, so yeah, those are the recommendations uh, on, on reading material. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Richard also was mentioning about determinism. Uh, and you know, this, this, this science that we, we follow as Marxists. And it's an important point because in the past, uh, we often took our science and we got a little too confident with it. We almost thought that we could predict everything and that history would automatically follow what was laid out, you know, according to the laws of historical materialism and dialectics. Um, but we, we almost sometimes, I think, forgot the other part of science, which is sometimes the experiment doesn't yield the result you thought it would, right? And that's another principle of Marxism, is that practice is really the criterion of truth. You have to test your science and see if you were right with, with your analysis, with your predictions, um, and, and not let it not let the theory itself uh, drive everything that you think is going to happen. Um, because sometimes it, it doesn't work out like you thought. Um, but that doesn't mean the science has failed as long as you go back and repeat the analysis, right? And, and follow those steps again and see what, what was it that you missed or what conditions changed since you first made a strategic uh, uh, decision or made a, a certain policy. And that's for, that's true for the Communist Party, for the different united front work or coalitions that we might, we might be involved in. We have to repeat that process. Uh, that's, that's what makes it a science, is that we follow these, these laws, but uh, we, we check out when they don't work, and we, we try to find out why. Uh, Rosa Leo, I think you, you started touching on some of the, the material that I believe will be in the next class, or I don't want to say next class, but I know there is a class planned specifically on dialectical materialism that uh, I think will probably get into those those other categories and parts of of the methodology, like content and form, appearance and essence, cause and effect. Uh, we touched on it a bit tonight, but without really digging into it in depth, since we were trying to keep it at an an intro level. But I think uh, if people want to follow up, I really recommend going to that that next class. I'm not sure when it's scheduled, but I did see that it's coming at some point. Um, okay, uh, I think I covered everything that I have in the notes here. Uh, I did want to thank Eric. He had he was the first one to speak this evening during the comments section and give him a little credit. Eric is one of my colleagues at People's World and, and he offered some helpful suggestions on, on how to structure this class and comparing what the corporate press does and what a Marxist journalist would do. So just want to mention that and thank Eric. Uh, I think that, that, that wraps up what I had prepared uh, for the evening. Dee? Okay, so uh, we would like to thank uh, CJ, uh, and we'd like to invite uh, CJ to share with us uh, other ideas uh, he uh, or resources that he has in terms of classes. And uh, I will look at this uh, book, uh, Economics for Everyone, and CJ, if you'd like to maybe come back and lead a, 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 a talk on that book maybe we can put that in the hopper so uh thank you or anything else you think might be maybe, helpful. maybe we can even get the author to do one i know he does a lot of uh classes for community groups coalitions parties so maybe i can get so in touch with him reach out to him and let me know reach sure. out to him and see if he would be uh, uh open to such a uh 
an activity. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We never have enough time. Sorry to those who have their um, hands raised and we weren't able to uh, get to you. Please join us for our uh, uh, future classes. If you have not signed up for our newsletter, go to cpusa.org. Uh, sign up for the newsletter so that you will receive uh, notices about all of our upcoming classes and activities. So thank you again, CJ, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, tonight. Thank you and good night. Thank you, CJ. Thanks, Dee, and thanks to the Education Commission. <laughs>